Bear Down Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the Designer, Jason McKee, here on a Wednesday. Y'all know how we get down, man. We don't have any more press conferences to react to, J-Mac. I'm kind of happy about that. I'm not going to lie. I hate hearing Flus talk after uh, <laughs> to tell me nothing. You know what I mean? It, it kind of irritates me. But we still got a special guest on the show today. J-Mac always hooking us up with connections. J-Mac, who you got for us today, brother? Yeah, I got a good friend of mine, Greg Gabriel. Um, over 30-plus years of NFL scouting, nine years as scouting director. He's also the host of Gabriel Talks Football on the Barroom Network. And uh, he's also... Um, an advisor aboard, on the board of advisors for the East-West Shrine game. My buddy, Greg Gabriel. Greg, how you doing? Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm, I'm doing good, Jay. Mac, how you been, man? Good, I got to congratulate you, too. I forgot. You guys did what, – what, what you got to the quarterfinals in the States? Yeah, we made it to the quarterfinals, um, and we ended up losing to uh, Nazareth Academy, who went on to win state. So our two – our two losses were to uh, two state champions, Mount Carmel and the Nazareth Academy. So uh, the kid, the kids did well. You know, I was excited for them, and uh, it's definitely you know a great season. But you know, we're looking to continue that momentum into this next season. Hey, hey, man, you got down. Carmel going back in the right direction. That's for darn sure. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate I appreciate your support too, man. I know you've uh, you've been to a couple games, so it's just exciting to see. Uh, you know, as a coach from where you started and to see where it's starting to go. And, you know, it's going to take, you know, continued hard work to, to eventually hold up that state uh, championship trophy. Well, you know, my, my stepsons, both of my stepsons played at Carmel. And then my daughter okay. lived here her senior year in high school, so she went to Carmel. So, I'm yeah, I'm a big Carmel fan. Hey, oh, can't, go, can't never go wrong with that, man. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, like – the, the seeing what J Mac was able to build up out there, man, and just the the funniest thing in the world. I've said this a couple times on this pod is going out there and seeing J Mac absolutely losing his mind, and seeing <laughs> Owen Cruz just kind of like on one knee, just going like, "Hey guys, we just got to come together. We're good. Don't worry about it." Be like, it's a little different from what I grew up watching on uh, on TV. Hey, no, that's, that's, that's not the Owen I know now. <laughs> God, no. He's he's funny. I, I tell him I say as, as he as he gets older, he gets uh, his he he's more mild mannered. Like he'll still explode now. He'll still he'll explode on me and he'll explode on Coach Davis. But when it comes to the kids, he'll have his moments. But he's such a as great you know he's such a great teacher. Yeah, he has such yeah. a world of knowledge in the game of football. I mean, when he talks, you listen, and when you listen, you learn. So you know he's he's been a huge part of our success. He's done a great job with our offensive line, and you know I'm thrilled to have him. Looking forward to, uh, you know, to continue building what we started. We got a lot of interesting uh, aspects happening around the NFL with coaching right now. Let's let's talk a little bit about that. I want to get Greg's perspective on everything that is happening and kind of the turning point that this offseason is for the Chicago Bears as far as coaching wise. They're looking for the O.C., when you hear the names that they brought up, uh, the Leon Cohens, the Shane Waldrons, Greg uh, Roman has now been thrown into the mix, and I think he's an interesting name, uh, interesting candidate for developing the quarterback we have or the next guy, um, Clint Kubiak as well. When you hear all of those names, does it feel like the Bears are looking in the right direction finally? Yeah, I, I think all those names are A-list names. In fact, you know, I had – you know, just playing, put down names a couple of weeks ago because you figured the change was going to happen. And yeah. all those names were on the list, except Greg Olson, who I really like. I mean, you know, I work with Greg. He was here on Dick Duran's staff. He was Rex Grossman's original quarterback coach. And I got the utmost respect for Greg. Um, but all those other guys, and, and Waldron's a real interesting guy because – Nobody knew he was going to be available. All of a sudden, Pete Carroll gets let go in Seattle, and that yeah. comes out of nowhere. And, mm -hmm. and so he's the most interesting name. But I think what's even more interesting than that is that, except for Greg Roman, all of them, all these guys run the same offense the Bears ran. And yeah. so and mm -hmm. people say, oh, I don't want to see that offense. There's nothing wrong with the offense. The scheme itself is great. It's a proven winner in the National Football League. It's how you use that scheme. 
yeah, and how you use your players within that scheme. And I think that's where where Luke Getze failed. And so uh, these guys are going to be a lot more advanced, a lot better than Getze ever thought about being. And I think, and, and maybe I'm throwing darts at the wall here, but you know, when I listened to the the presser last week, and then you look at the names they've talked to, it's like. They, they want the same offense because they want to keep it simple for the guys that are already here. The yeah. transition is relatively nothing because your terminology is going to be pretty much the same. And so it's like, we're doing everything we can for JF. Now, could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong, but I counted between Kevin Warren, Poles and Flus five votes of confidence in that press conference for JF. So, uh, my opinion or belief is that he's going to be here next year. So if you were the GM and you're in a situation with the first overall pick, what would you do with this pick? Real opinion? Knowing what I know? Yeah. I'm trading. Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm, All tra- right. I'm trading question. down. What do you know? I, I, <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I can't say everything. I just saying there's, there's issues, um, issues that have to be answered, okay? And they will be answered between now and April, okay? And it's, is that the person you want leading your team? Is he the right person? I'm not taking anything away from the, the raw talent. The raw talent is there. Uh, but there's other things, and we have seen – time and time again that the first quarterback drafted in a in a draft isn't necessarily the best quarterback in that draft yeah. you know and, and i don't care what the all the accolades were and, and trust me i was one of the guys throwing out those accolades up until the notre dame game that this guy was the best since patrick mahomes but then in my opinion the wheels kind of fell off and his game changed and mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, he still put up good numbers, but he wasn't the same player. Right. And so to me, as an evaluator, my biggest question is why? Why? Okay, he had a bad game, but he can have a bad game. That You know, you, you can throw that out the window. But the other games weren't great either. And so, and, and then there's the time, you know, he, he loses the one game and he's sitting on mommy's lap and crying for 10 minutes. It's like, I've never seen that in my life. And I've been involved in this game since I've been eight years old. And so it's little questions like that. And then there's some, some other concerns that, you know, I don't really want to get into. And he's not a bad person. I don't want to right. leave yeah. that out there. Um, you know, he's not a, a criminal or anything like that. It's just, you know, some issues and some deal with leadership and stuff. But, um, you know, I know it. People around the league know it. And you do your research and you make a determination. I want them. I don't want them. I can live with them. I don't want to live with them. And But at that position, you better be right because at least in my way of thinking and the way I was brought up in this business, yeah, the physical talent has to be there, but the intangibles are like 50%. And if you don't got those right, the guy's going to fail. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting too because I just knowing it from a tape perspective, right, and watching his game, I see Caleb Williams as somebody who is amazingly talented. I'm I'm literally I'm doing a thing over on the breeze where I'm trying to watch every Caleb Williams game, basically until I convince I'm convinced that the Bears should take him with the pick or shouldn't take him with the pick. And going through the first couple of games of the season, one thing that just stands out immediately is. He didn't face a pass rush much this season at all. But when he did, I see some of those struggles take place. But he's still able to go out there and give you really good, talented things. So from a from a intangibles perspective, right, do you or I'm sorry, from a talent perspective, do you feel like his talent right now is more than what Justin Fields has? You know, I think it's a little different. I, I was talking to a guy and I don't want to mention his name, right? but I know J Mac knows who he is. Um, 
quarterback guru and a pretty damn good one. And he, I was talking to him last week, and he spent, I think it was a week ago yesterday, he was studying, he studied Fields, Stroud, Herbert, Mahomes, and Allen. And I said this on my podcast yesterday. So he came back and he said, Greg, there's an easy fix for this that'll fix a lot of his game. And he goes, I can't believe they didn't do it. And, 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 and he just said, his setup is notoriously slow, especially when he's from under center, but even when he's in the gun. And yeah. you speed that up, it speeds up everything else. And so he's starting, be, be, especially when he's from under center, he's starting off slow. And so then when he's facing the field, he's seeing things a, a little late. And then it makes it that much more difficult to make a decision. He said, all you got to do is fix that, and you fix a lot of his game. Now, it sounds really, really simple. It is simple. Why hasn't it been done? And, you know, we don't have the answer to that, but yeah. maybe yeah. we do because the guys who were responsible for that aren't here anymore. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. And, and I want to ask you, too, you know, going – more into this, the evaluation of quarterbacks, and you've gone through so many drafts and evaluated so many players, Greg. You know, talk about, you know, when it starts in terms of when you guys are evaluating a, qu a quarterback. You know, what are, what are the must-haves? What are the red flags you guys look for, uh, which helps you guys make that determination on whether or not, you know, you guys would take a quarterback? Well, more so than any position, you know, you want to have a good two years of tape. You know, and, and theoretically, you'd want to do it chrono chronologically. But you have to, mm -hmm. like if I'm doing a, a, a running back, you know, you're a fullback. You know, you're not involved mm -hmm. in every single play. It's a lot easier to evaluate a guy at your position than the quarterback. But the quarterback, you've got to look at every single game situation. What's he do on first down? What's he do on second down? What's he do on third down? And the different down and distance situations. Uh, What's his accuracy to the right? What's his accuracy to the left? You know, when does he have turnovers? Why does he have turnovers? You know, so you got to break down everything. So there's a lot of analytics involved. And, you know, it's funny as we were doing all this stuff, you know, 20 years ago, but nobody called it analytics because they hadn't made it up yet. We were just making our own analytics up and, you know, just going through the tape. But it's, you got to do that, and then you've got to really find out about the person, the the football character of the person. Does he love the game? Does he want to be a great player? Is he a strong leader? Does he get along with his teammates? Does he get along with his coaches? Does he take coaching? Um, you know, all those types of things. Uh, and then, you know, how important is the game to him? You know, if the game's not real important, then you got a problem. And, you know, we, we had a guy, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not afraid to mention the name because it was, you know, even his agent will admit to him, you know, we, we, we drafted, uh, same year we drafted Rex, we drafted Michael Haynes in the first round. Were you here then, J-Mac? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great person. Couldn't find a nicer kid. He didn't like the mm -hmm. game. He could care less about the game of football. That was on us. That was our mistake and he failed because he didn't have football character didn't have a passion for the game and so and you, if you don't have the answers to all those questions then you know and think positively about all those things then you can't pull the trigger on any player and i don't care if it's caleb williams or or drake may or whoever you yeah. know it, it's you, you've got to have the right feeling you go back to last year's draft and you know, a lot of people said, well, the Bears should have taken Jalen Carter. Well, Jalen Carter had character issues. They're noted. And where Darnell Wright is got a pretty damn strong passion for the game. You know, they made the right mm -hmm. decision. And if you look at Jalen's play, Jalen started off because he's got great natural talent. Nobody's ever going to question that. Started off the season mm -hmm. real strong. The last six games, he was just a guy on the field. And so, you know, why is that? Well, part of that has to do with that drive, that passion, and everything else. And you could say, you, you could honestly say that, you know, Gervon Dexter, who was a second-round pick, outplayed Jalen Carter the last third of the season. 
And I don't think anybody will even argue with you. Mm. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, let me ask you this, because you, you brought something up about the intangibles. The locker room clearly has backed Justin Fields. There's never been a question. Like, it, it, DJ Moore, like, literally, whenever reporters would bring a mic near him, he'd be like, y'all not trading Justin, right? All right, cool. Let's just keep it going then. All right, now ask your question. When you see that, that kind of support in the locker room, you've been a part of uh, situations where you've brought in somebody else, right? I, I think about, you know, bringing in a Cedric Benson, right? Or, uh, when Thomas Jones was already there. How much of a change does that make in the locker room? How hard is that decision where I see all the talent this guy has, right? We can see all the talent for Caleb Williams, but everyone loves Justin. Well, now that it's, you know, almost 20 years after the fact, you, could say, you know, that, that was that was a big lovey pick originally. Yeah. And, and it had nothing to do with what Thomas Jones did or couldn't do. I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, Thomas was getting a little older and running backs notoriously can fall off at any moment. He didn't do it because he just, you know, he was such a pro and really, yeah. you know, took care of himself really well. So he's the exception rather than the rule. But, you know, the perfect example is, is the veterans, which is, you know, we didn't see that coming. But the veterans are like, hey, no, this is our guy. Yeah. And, and, and you know, said was the outcast. And, you know, it, it, it led to a bad situation. And did we make a mistake? Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I wasn't totally on board on that one. Um, <coughs> you know, I just and, and if you go back, that's really the last draft. When running back, when a bunch of running backs went high, three went in the top five. That never yeah. happens anymore. But <laughs> it, it, it was, um, it was just crazy, and and you learn from it because we saw exactly what one player meant to the, the rest of the players in the locker room on both sides of the ball, not just on the offensive side, because of the defensive guys used to kick. Can I swear? Used to kick the hell out. Of, yeah. <laughs> they used to kick the hell out of said in practice. I mean, so mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it was just it was something that I had never seen before in my whole career. And at that point, you know, it had been twenty five years in the league or something like that. And so when you, when you go fast forward to this year, and you see and and. Uh, J Mac can probably attest to this better than me because he's there every day, but it's almost unanimous, if not unanimous, that every guy in the locker room has got JF's backing, is backing JF rather. And that says a lot. You pull him out of, of that of this team, what's going to happen to your locker room? Because they got his back. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and like Greg, you know, talking about you know Cedric and, and that Thomas Jones situation, it, it was funny because when we drafted Cedric, uh, they moved my locker, and my locker's Thomas Jones is on this side and Cedric's on this side. So I'm the guy in the middle, and I'm like the mediator. So when Thomas isn't there, Cedric comes and talks about his issues, and then vice versa. When Cedric's not here, Thomas comes in and talks about his issues. And I remember going to Coach Spence. I said, Coach, <laughs> this thing, I'm not the psychologist. This isn't, this isn't my job. <laughs> but, you're you're going to play Father J Mac there, huh? I mean, you're like, yeah, a, I had to, like, like the I had to be the glue. I had to be the glue, man, to keep it together. Um, but, you know, like, like, like Greg's saying, though, the locker room is something that's, you know, for a coach when you, or an organization, when you lose that locker room, it's hard to get it back, the trust. And, and when you're not, rewarding your guys or you're not, you know, listening at least to the heartbeat of the locker room it makes it tough. And it, and it definitely was a tough situation for all of us when said it was there because as a rookie, you know, we wanted to welcome him in, but at the same time, you know, our guy was Thomas. So it was definitely a weird dynamic. Um, I think those two ended up the year that the years that they had together ended up complimenting each other really well in a yeah. weird way. Um, but, you know, talking more about the draft, Greg, what other position do you think the Bears, you know, must need, must draft uh, this upcoming uh, draft? Like, besides quarterback, you know, what other positions do you think they should they should take with that other first round pick? 
Well, I, I believe that they will take a quarterback. I don't believe they will take a quarterback using that first pick. Okay. okay. Because I think, you know, th- th- there is a need to get more quarterbacks. And, and I like the backup right now. You know, I, I think bajan has got something to him. But yeah. still, you look at his background, you want competition. I mean, we all know that. The more competition you got, the better the situation. Um, if, if you look, at, and, you know, I study the way people draft, always have. And also, when you want to learn about a guy and what, how he thinks, you got to look at his background. Where did he come from? Who did he work for? And what they do? Right. You know, so you, you look at that and, and, and how they've – drafted and how like Kansas city drafted when, when polls was there and you look at the positions he's taken here, there's not a doubt in my mind that the key position that he hasn't taken yet is an edge. He signed as a free agent, signed a couple as a free agent. He's drafted defensive tackles. He's drafted offensive linemen. He's drafted corners, all really key important positions. He hasn't drafted an edge. So it's a pretty good edge class. I'd say it's a damn good bet. Obviously, it's got to fall right that one of those picks is going to be an edge. And part of it's cap reason. You know, you want, I, I can't see them going out. You know, they already got 20 million plus for sweat per year. I can't see them going out and spending another 18, 20, 22 million on another free agent edge player. It just doesn't make sense from a cap standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to bring in a young guy, talented guy. That, and they play a rotation, so who can play within the rotation. If you can get Ngakwe back at the, at the same uh, contract you got last year, that's fine. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't being overpaid. Yeah. You're getting paid yeah. commensurate to what is his, his uh, value was. So I, I think that's a given. Wide receiver, I think, is a given. They just don't have enough talent. But I'll say this, and this is you know from the outside looking in. Who was one of the guys let go? The wide receiver coach. What position has underachieved the last two years? The wide receiver position. These guys yeah. haven't developed. Bayless Jones, third round pick, hasn't developed. You know, Scott, hot and cold. And, and, and Mooney regressed. And we saw yeah. what he could do his first year. So who's that on? Is, is, is there something wrong with the player or is that the coach? And the coach isn't here. So I think the people that make the decisions are saying, yeah, I think we got to make a change here because these guys aren't getting better. And then obviously you had the Claypool debacle and that didn't work out for whatever reason. So I think, you know, it, it's imperative that they get somebody strong in that room who has a history of developing young guys. Yeah, and I, I think the the wide receiver room is probably the one that interests Bears fans most because of the fall off of Darnell Mooney. I said it halfway through the season, right? It felt like it felt like Luke Getze had picked Tyler Scott as his guy, and all the plays that we normally would have seen go to Mooney, all of a sudden we're going to Tyler Scott. We're I mean, I remember after the Detroit game, me and J Mac were sitting here. We were like, How's Tyler Scott the one that's running the the deep ball route down the field? Well, part, well, part of it is one pass in the second half. Part of it is, and 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 the way the way that Green Bay runs this the Shanahan offense is the the X is generally a pretty big guy, and so, but after um, EQ got hurt and the Claypool thing didn't work out, they didn't have that big guy, so right. now they put Scott there, and Scott's a little guy, you know, Scott's a yeah. A, a, a Z receiver or a slot receiver, not not an X receiver. And so really he's playing out of position as how they ran the scheme. Now another team running the same scheme can use their receivers differently, but they didn't have the proper piece to play that position. So And, and Mooney's not the right guy for that position either, in, in right. fairness. But, uh, you know, I thought after two years, this guy's going to be a hell of a pro. He can run, he can catch, he yeah. runs good routes. There's nothing he doesn't yeah. do. He plays bigger than his size. Um, what happened? You know, and, and, and yeah. I can't figure it out because I know the talent's there. We saw the talent. We saw it his first two yeah. years. Yeah, great. We, you know, we talk about development all the time as, as football coaches and analysts, and obviously you, you 
heard that word a lot. And you look at the teams in the NFC North, you look at Detroit, you look at Green Bay, you look at what Green Bay now has with all the receivers that they have, young receivers, and those guys have developed. You know, we didn't hear much about those guys. Um, now they're making plays, you know, Wicks, and you look at Jalen Reed, um, uh, you look at the guy from Rutgers they have there. We talk about development. And when you look at the coordinators that they've interviewed, who would be your choice to bring in in terms of being a good teacher, being a good developer of, of talent, and being able to take this offense to the next level? Who would you pick as the uh, new OC if you had a choice? You know, as much as I'd like to say this guy or that guy, without there's one guy in that group that I've ever talked to, and that's Greg Olson. You know, okay. so um, so I, I don't know the answer. You know, yeah. I mean, they got to feel comfortable. I think it, it it looks based on the on the interviews, they mm -hmm. want to stay pretty much with the same scheme. But I also think it's very interesting that they they brought in Roman, who has a history of number one being a good uh, coordinator, number two working with a very athletic quarterback and having yeah. success with them. Uh, but the only difference I see with Greg Roman versus these other guys is all the other guys coming from the Shannon school, they're going to run a lot of the outside zone blocking schemes where you got to have the real athletic offensive lineman. And, and that's one thing you can say about the bears offensive line. The guys that draft are all very, very athletic big men yeah. on that side or on that part of the line. So how he's going to fit and how he's going to sell the powers that can be, because you're not going to go out and change all these linemen. Now, you can put weight on them and all that, obviously. <clears throat> but the scheme, the blocking scheme will change. So I, I, it's going to be interesting how they, they come to a decision on that. You know, interviewing these coordinators, right? But then you keep your O-line coach and you keep the tight end coach. Like, how is that dynamic? Because the, the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach got to have that special relationship. You know what I'm saying? The offensive line coach is usually right. the run game coordinator. The offensive coordinator usually is more involved in the passing game. Like, I, I just feel – I think that's kind of weird. You know, you're looking to bring in a high-level guy, and you say, okay, we want you to, to run the show, but here's your line coach, here's your tight end coach. It's like, you know, you're telling the chef, we want you yeah. to cook this good meal, but you only <laughs> – here's two ingredients you already have. Like, you know, it's, it's just kind of weird to me. That's how Iron Chef works, j Mac. That's literally the show. We want you to cook the meal. This your ingredients are chef. ice cream and tuna fish. We saw Iron Chef last year. It didn't work. That's why that guy's not here. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it, it's a very interesting question. And, and I, I listened to Olin last week on the radio and he was like, I really like Chris Morgan, like him as a person, like him as a coach. I think he's a good coach, but I don't think they did that right. And I, yeah. I totally get what he's saying. I don't totally agree. And mm. the reason being is, like I say, it's becoming obvious they want to run the same scheme just yeah. by virtue of, of who they've interviewed so far. And they already know they got a good coach who can coach within that scheme. And ultimately the coaching hires fall on the head coach. And who's to say the guy, you know, Shane Waldron or, or uh, Kubiak or whoever is going to, you know, his guy is going to be as good a coach as Chris Morgan is. And, the, the, like I said, the ultimate decision, it falls on the head coach. And so he's, he's the guy that's going to be held accountable. Yeah. There's validity to the OC wanting his own guy, but if you feel you already got the right guy here, I, I don't see a big problem with it, especially if they're not changing the scheme. Yeah. I think too, right? Like when you look at Clint Kubiak and Shane Waldron, Clint Kubiak, especially right he can't have this long list of offensive line coaches that he's re you know, ready to bring it because he's so young in the game, right? When you look at Shane Waldron, Shane Waldron's been an OC for two years. The guy he's got is the guy that's in Seattle with him. You know, and I listen, I, I saw Seattle's offensive line. I don't know if I want that here either. It's, it's, it's okay. It's maybe a little bit better, but it's still scary. Like Gino was running for his life a little bit. So I, I like the fact that you have somebody that is in place and you're still able to get these kind of names. If we were struggling to get interviews with some of these guys, and maybe I guess if we don't hire one of these guys that it seems like would really fit well here, 
then maybe it becomes an issue. But it does feel like, right, like you're giving guys a leg up already. Like, listen, Shane, don't worry about finding this guy. Don't worry about finding this guy. We've got them already in place. Well, you know what? That, that's interesting. And, and you don't really hear it brought up because it's behind the scenes. It used to be. And, 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 and like even when, when, except for Ron Rivera, Lovey put together his, his whole staff. But truth be told, when, when Lovey came here, he wanted Marinelli to be the, the D.C., but Tampa wouldn't know. So now we didn't have we didn't have a DC and we were the ones that got him Ron Rivera. So but now you're seeing more and more around the league that the GM is more involved in the coaching hires, the assistant coaching hires, than they've ever been. And yeah. part of it is is they got well, I don't I want to say this the right way, but a lot of times, you know, coaches got tunnel vision. And I'm not saying this in, in a negative way, but they're, who they've been around is narrow compared to who, say, a GM's been around. And, you know, so what they know, and I know, like, when I was here, one of the jobs our scouts had had nothing to do with looking at players. They had a scout coaches, too. So when you're at a college and you see a coach that really jumps out, be it, you know, a, a, a position coach or whatever, Take notes on this guy, find out about his history, and let us know because that's going to be, you know, could be a guy we need to hire a year from now, two years from now, and we want to have that short list. So I think that's what part of it is, is just that GMs all over in the league are a lot more involved than they used to be and who the coaches are going to be on the you know, Matt Eberflew is being retained as head coach. He's won 10 games in two years. And they didn't even, you know, when, when Poles was asked during the press conference, hey, did you did you talk to Jim Harbaugh? And he's like, ah, oh, you know, Coach Harbaugh is the coach from Michigan. They didn't even entertain looking at any of, the, any of these other possible candidates. Uh, what is your thoughts on Coach Eberflew being retained as head coach here? You know, again, I'm, I'm real big on reading between the lines mm-hmm. and, and listening. I think if you go back to when it was before they hit that winning four out of five streak or right at the beginning and yeah. uh, Ryan did an impromptu presser and he really jumped on the table for flus. That point right there said he, he didn't go anywhere. You know, they, he's already sold them that, He's the right guy. So I also thought at that point, yeah, there are going to be changes. And the changes that I thought were going to happen did happen. So, and they, and they still got, you know, they got to make some changes on the defensive side too that they haven't made yet. Uh, but it's, since I've been around this franchise and even before that, Except for Tressman, no no coach has ever been let go after two years. And it has nothing to do with money. I think it's just a really you, – you keep – if you go out and change a coach every two years, you're going to be – two years from now, you're going to be changing it again. Two years after that, you're going to be changing it again because you're not giving them yeah. an opportunity to build a program. And not only that, you're bringing a new coach, you're bringing in a whole new scheme. Half the damn players yeah. they got went out and acquired the last two years between the draft and free agency – might not even be scheme fits. So it it just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I think that continuity in building a program is very, very important. And and they're going with that. They believe he's the right guy. Did he make some mistakes in this hire? Absolutely. Should he be held accountable for that? Absolutely. But he's also going to learn from that. You know, hey, you know, I was in New York when, when Bill Parcells became the first head coach. They thought after year one, they bombed, they they blew it. They they got the wrong guy. Well, they had a little patience, and now he's yeah. in the Hall of Fame. I, I just believe that that there's a lot of the conversations that we're having now aren't happening if Flus makes the right decision in some of these situations, but you still see the improvement at the end of the year. It's almost very much like Justin Fields where I see a ton of bad, but I see, in my opinion, more good. 
I see a lot of bad with flus, but I saw the good at the end of the year. But is that enough with the coaching candidates that are on the market? You got Belichick, Harbaugh, uh, uh, Vrabel's out there. Like, there's so many good candidates. Did they make the right call on that? Oh, you know, I can argue some of these with you, like Vrabel. Vrabel's done uh-huh. a great job for, what, four years or something. The last yeah, right. two years, Tennessee sucked. So what happened? And that, that was pretty much – none of us had the answer. Got to do a lot of digging on that to find out why. Belichick right. is going to be a Band-Aid. He's the same age as me, six months younger than me. So – you know, how much longer he's going to work. I mean, you know, Bill's 72 years old. He's going to, is he going to work past 75? Uh, you know, we've never seen that before. I, you know, and I don't think it's so. He's like, yeah, I'll go someplace, I'll turn it around, and then all of a sudden, and health issues come up. Trust me, I know about that because I got my own. You know, they can come up just like that. So uh, who knows how much longer he's going to be around. And Harbaugh, Harbaugh, I think, wants to go back to Michigan. He'd be a first-time ever coach that left a, a, te- a school that won a national championship. I think the only reason he's even entertaining anything for the NFL is because the NCAA is ready to hang him, and he's trying to get mm-hmm. some sort of an agreement that nothing's going to happen to him. And he needs, but I think you know if if those issues that he has with the NCAA weren't there, we're not even bringing his name up. Mm. That That's true. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. I, I literally only think Harbaugh's – I literally only believe Harbaugh's coming back to the league because, the like you said, like he doesn't believe he's going to have playoff eligibility for the next couple of years. I, that's the only reason I think Harbaugh is even an option. Like, is he done playing the rat race, playing the game that the NCAA is putting out there? Well, I, I just think he's looking for protection. I can hear you now. I, I, I just think he's looking for protection, and it came out. He wants, you know, he wants to be assured by Michigan he's he's going to be retained as coach after the NCAA comes up with a final ruling. He's trying to yeah. protect himself, and I think he's using the NFL as leverage. I personally don't think he wants to leave Michigan, you know, but he he wants to have some sort of situation to fall back on if he gets hung by the NCAA. So this upcoming weekend's playoff games, Greg, uh, we got Houston visiting the Ravens. What's your thoughts on that game? Ravens had a week off to rest. They're right now the best team in the – AFC, maybe the second best team. You know, my hometown Bills, I got a propensity <laughs> for. Um, yeah. I, I, can just, I think the Ravens are going to win that. Um, if Buffalo is healthy, I think they'd beat KC. But, my God, they lost about five guys Man. on defense in that game uh, yeah. s- Monday night. And so, I, you know, I don't know what they're going to do on defense. But I know one thing. It's still going to snow two more feet between now and Saturday. <laughs> on the way, Because my, my kids live there, and, and yeah. they're telling me, my daughter, my da- daughter sent me a thing where they had 24 inches last night, and she lives like six miles from the stadium. So, um, wow. you know, the, the, it'll be done by Friday, but it's going to be a mess there. Yeah, yeah, Greg, I know your your daughter went to the game and I saw you tweeted out a picture of her seats. And it was like, <laughs> I mean, it was like, I mean, she was sitting on a snow mound. It was, it was crazy. No, like, she never sat. <laughs> <laughs> she never sat. She stood the whole time. I had one daughter there. The other daughter couldn't go. She was in India. Her, her daughter's a cheerleader and they had these huge, had this huge cheerleading competition in India that she had to take her daughter to. But Usually both of my girls are at the games and they're, they're huge, huge fans. And uh, yeah, Kelsey can't wait. And she's a big Taylor Swift fan too. And the, the, there's a box that's like six rows behind her seats. And, and it's a box that has different people in it every week. So she like sends me a text. She goes, I wonder if that's the box that Taylor's going to rent this week. She goes, I'll go crazy. You know, I mean, she's a huge fan, but <clears throat> She loves going and oh, she, the, 
I'm sorry. The, the Swifties are everywhere. The Swifties are everywhere, man. <laughs> man, I, I tell you what, I, I I know we have rowdy fans here in Chicago, but I saw in Buffalo there was a video in which it was a bunch of fans on top of a snow mountain, and it was a burning table of fire, and they jumped off the snow mountain onto the table. Like that's some that's some fans for you, man. Buffalo's always had like a good environment, a, a great environment to play in. So I'm. I'm rooting for Buffalo as well, Greg. That's that's what I've got. I'm rooting for. But like you said, though, those injuries, tough to overcome. I hope they can overcome those. They're going to have all weekend. backups at the linebacker position. That's a good. I think I think we're going to make that the episode there, boys. I mean, <laughs> we appreciate Greg coming through as always. The internet was fighting us. The cold is fighting us, but they won't be fighting. Us. It's not fighting as hard as Kansas City is going to be fighting that snow on Sunday. Greg. We appreciate you coming on the episode again, as always. Let the people know what you have coming up. Let the people know where they can find you at. Well, I, you know, I, I do some writing for Windy City Gridiron. Got my podcast once a week over on the Barroom Network. And, of course, uh, I got my ex uh, account. But I right now I'm PO'd at the Bears, so I haven't been saying much about the Bears because I didn't like the Cliff Stein situation. Um, but – you know, I'll, I'll be back on that one sooner rather than later. Yeah, well, can't can't wait to see you jump back on the horse, Greg. And I, you guys I, I froze saw, up on I me again. that on Twitter. I I I was gonna say I said I can't wait to see you get back on X talking about the Bears again. I saw the uh, the your reaction to the Cliff Stein situation on Twitter, and. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people were like, "Man, this is how I get my Bears information from Craig on Twitter." So this is going to be interesting to see how uh, the rest of this offseason goes.